Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year ten. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the twenty-third to the twenty-sixth, if I'm not mistaken. Ah,、uh, actually, I think it's the twenty-fourth to the twenty-seventh. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So, well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching. And I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and is that the campsite in the Lake District? No, actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night, and they told me that if we had over fifty children, which we do, they could give us a further ten percent off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. Okay. So now these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes. Go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around seven on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare, and that children love. Yes. Then lights out would be at nine thirty, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at seven on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at seven thirty, an hour's hiking from eight till nine, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to eleven. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know. Yes, great idea. And then, let's see, a picnic lunch at twelve, and then sports in the afternoon till four. Another swim until five, and then supper. After clean up around six thirty, we could have a talkback session. 
where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given to new employees at a museum. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 13. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Myers, and on behalf of everybody here at Stevensbridge Dungeons, I would like to welcome you all to our entertainment team. This year, the hiring process was especially competitive, and it might interest you all to know that for every position, there are almost 30 applicants, so you really are the best of the best. In a moment, I will take you on a tour of the museum so you can get an idea of what the space is like. But first of all, I would like to show you around the staff room. Our staff room is located at the back of the building over here. You will notice that there are two entrances to the staff room. One leads to the room we're in now, which is the main and oldest dungeon here at Stevensbridge, which we have turned into the museum. This is where you will greet the new visitors and also where the tour throughout the dungeons will begin. I should mention now that we only ever send visitors through as part of a group. So even on the busy days, you will still get roughly 10 minutes of free time between each group. Make sure you use that time wisely, because you'll need to get straight back into character as soon as it's over. Now look at questions 14 to 20. Right, follow me and I'll show you the layout of the museum. From the museum, we can pass through this door near the interactive display into the staff room. From here, you can see the steps at the far side in the opposite corner that lead outside into Berwick Street. 
When you arrive for a shift, it will be much easier for you all to come in the Berwick Street entrance, directly down the steps to the staff room. If you come in through the main visitor entrance, it will take you longer to get past security. As you can all see, there are lockers on your right-hand side. Uh, they should be big enough for you to put your bags and coats in. You'll get given keys later that work with any of the lockers in here. Over on the other side, past the lockers, is our most exciting area. This is where our wardrobe and makeup will take place. Every shift, you will be transformed from normal people into grotesque medieval prisoners. If you're lucky, you get to be the jailer, but even they rarely bathed in those days. Of course, some of you might consider yourselves method actors, but please do try to shower before your shift. <laughs> We don't want to give visitors an experience that's too authentic. Now, we do have a staff shower here if you really need it. It is located next to the staff toilets, which are unisex. I hope nobody has too much of a problem with that. Unfortunately, dungeons were not really designed with comfort in mind. You can find the bathroom at the other end of the room from the makeup area. There is also another toilet for the public, concealed just to the right of the door into this room. Let's move back into the museum. We have three main sections down here. The first one you pass into when you leave the staff room is the museum. This is where all the useful information can be found such as dates, number of prisoners and the kinds of torture that were used. I know it's a lot of information to take in on your first day, but try to learn as much of it as you can. Even though you'll mostly be in character, visitors might want to ask you some questions, and it would be great if you could tell them more about the dungeons. I think it would be more interesting if visitors could learn directly from you, rather than having to read about it. As you can see, on the left we have an interactive display for children, and on the right we have a photo booth. This was the original dungeon, first built in 1435. Now, let's pass through into the main dungeon that was added during the Tudor period in around 1570. You might be able to feel that the air is a lot damper and cooler here. That is because we are now beneath the River Stevens. This is primarily the room in which most of you will be working. This is where many high-profile religious figures were held, sometimes for years on end. Depending on the roles you'll be playing, you can either be chained up, free to roam, or, if you're a jailer, wandering between prisoners to keep an eye on them. Now we will pass into our third and final section, the prison cells. Over here, you can see there are some wooden stocks and a fake gibbet. <laughs> Don't worry, I can see a couple of you looking concerned. You don't need to reenact any of the torture scenes for visitors. One person each shift will play the jailer in here, where you will give a speech to the group about some of the more notable prisoners to stay here in the past. This is usually the end of the tour, but some visitors will certainly want to ask you more questions at this point, so please try your best to make yourselves available. Help them by answering any questions they have. Also, feel free to guide the visitors through the museum if you see that they're going the wrong way. This concludes our introduction to your new workplace. If you'll please follow me, I will get you all issued with your keys and some information about the dungeons that you can take home with you to study. I will also introduce you to your shift supervisor, Alice Stiles, and you can ask her any questions you may have about your roles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three.
You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Doctor Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers, successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it, but it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prized close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway. Go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important, though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer. And only one third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive, who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hardworking people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something, she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well. Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. 
they don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we, came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job. And learn something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide, and today we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal, and here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog, a dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well. The story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheep dogs, which work in unison with their masters, need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America, and Australia 
receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog, wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the Territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.